Hi again, and welcome back to my channel. My name's Juliet, um, and today I want to talk about um, the power by Naomi Alderman, but I want to talk about it in relation to The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood. Um, so I read The Handmaid's Tale originally in the, well, probably just not long after it was published. It was published in 1985, and I probably read it around about that time. Um, and I was absolutely blown away by it at the time um, and its ideas and what it was saying about gender and gender roles. Um, and then I recently watched a TV adaptation of The Handmaid's Tale and I was struck with how dated the story was watching it in 2016 as opposed to when I read it in the 1980s. Um, and then I went on and read The Power by Naomi Alderman which had been recommended on a number of booktube channels. And all the way through reading The Power I kept thinking this is what Margaret Atwood would have written if she wrote The Handmaid's Tale today, in, in this time. Um, I then later found out that Naomi Alderman and Margaret, Margaret Atwood had actually been working together, or certainly Naomi had um, sought advice from Margaret Atwood, um, which I hadn't realised when I was reading it. So really, in this video, I want to try and explain why the power is the Handmaid's Tale of the 21st century, and why, therefore, I don't think the TV adaptation had the power that it could have had. So if we sort of think about when The Handmaid's Tale was written in the 1980s, women had gone through quite a revolution um, post-war. Um, feminism was um, growing, women were demanding equal rights, they were not content with being in the home and raising children, um, and they started pushing for recognition in the workplace and they started demanding that men did more to help out with the raising of children. So when The Handmaid's Tale was written, I think there was a real optimism around the future of women and equality of the sexes. So The Handmaid's Tale was a cautionary tale about what would happen if feminism hadn't arrived, um, and what would happen if we didn't keep fighting for the rights of women. But I, f I feel the sense was, at the time, that um, The Handmaid's Tale, as I say, was a cautionary tale, but that women's rights were going to continue to develop, equality was, gonna, was going to continue for women, um, and we'd be able to look on something like The Handmaid's Tale and sort of laugh about how ridiculous it would be to have that situation occur today. I guess with all movements where you have a weaker group um, up against a stronger group, so male um, dominance um, in the workplace, male dominance in most areas of life, in academia, in business, um, in medicine, even in my own profession of educational psychology, um, it was pretty much dominated by men up until the late 70s. And I know this because I trained at um, University College London and on the wall of our classroom, um, which we all look at for three years because it's, it's a three-year doctorate. All the photos of the previous cohorts of educational psychologists are up on that wall and obviously we get very excited about the fact that eventually our photo will join it. And if you look at the photos um, when they began in the 1960s, the groups of educational psychologists that were qualifying were majority male with one or two females. And then by the mid-1970s, there was a, an even mix of um, men and women in each cohort. And then from about the 1990s on, it reversed. We ended up with more women um, than men um, qualifying as educational psychologists. Why this has happened, I don't know, except that we tend to class education as a female activity or a female career. Certainly in primary schools it's very unusual to have male primary school teachers for example. And what tended to happen is men tended to move into clinical psychology which is a more medicalised type of psychology. Um, so I'm wondering if the um, increasing amount of women joining the educational psychology courses actually devalued the course in the eyes of men so they were more likely to turn to clinical um, psychology. I've completely forgotten the point I was making there, but I think what I was talking about is I think there was a sense of optimism when The Handmaid's Tale was written, 
um, that women would just keep on getting more equal and we would reach a point in time where we would find it ridiculous to suggest that certain careers suited men because of their biological traits and that certain careers suited women because of their biological traits. But actually what has happened since the 1980s is it hasn't been, we haven't reached that point where we have equality between the genders. We haven't reached a point where we can accept that um, perceived biological differences between the genders are actually um, social constructs. Despite the fact that there's a huge amount of growing evidence that shows that male and female brains, for example, are exactly the same as each other, you couldn't tell a male brain or a female brain from a scan, and in fact there's more variation within gender than there is between gender. But I would argue actually society is becoming even more um, divided by gender. Um, always seeing I mean, if you think about advertising, think about when uh, um, we have advertising for um, domestic products, it always features an inept man who isn't capable of managing the home. Um, and it's the woman that has to manage the home. But when we think about um, technology um, and gaming, we immediately think of men and we think that women aren't as good as me at men as doing those things. Again, there is no scientific evidence. Um, that men are inherently better at reading maps or doing technology and women are inherently better at talking and listening and caring for small children. The problem we have is because we immediately want to know whether you've had a boy or a girl, we immediately start treating that child based on the gender stereotypes that we have. So this is why I think the power has a by Naima Alderman, has a lot more to say about gender stereotypes and gender divide um, than The Handmaid's Tale, because The Handmaid's Tale it was in a different era and we thought things would get better. So the power, if you don't know, just very briefly, is where females um, develop a power which makes them stronger than men. Um, and therefore the, the novel really is about the, the rise of females and the fall of men. And it's set or contextualised or framed by letters to and from a female and a, a male author and you have some letters at the beginning and then you have the story and then you have some letters at the end um, and it's only when you get to the letters at the end that it really all then becomes begins to become clear um, the messages that Naomi Alderman is trying to um, explore and really what she's trying to explore is the idea that we have certain fixed ideas about genders um, if you haven't read the book, this might be a little bit of a spoiler because I want to talk about the letters at the end. So the letters are between Naomi and a fictitious author called Neil. Um, and Neil um, is looking up to Naomi. Um, he sees her as a very powerful author um, and he wants her opinion of his manuscript, which he calls an historical novel. So he brings in what he believes are historical facts, but he weaves them into a story. And he writes to Naomi and says, you know, there is evidence here that um, there was a time in history when men were the powerful ones and women were the weaker ones. And Naomi, the female author, basically laughs at this suggestion. She says, she, she writes back to Neil and says, yes, I know that there are statues of male soldiers that existed 5,000 years ago, but let's not forget women quite like men in uniform. So the chances are those male statues just represent what women um, enjoyed sexually um, and so she doesn't really buy into the fact that, it, that things could ever have been the other way around and she makes the comment of, of saying but you know what Neil the world might just be a kinder and more peaceful place if only men were in charge and that is certainly something that certainly in the end of the 20th century seemed to be very much um, what people were saying they were saying if women were in charge of the world then there would be no war um, and everyone would be kinder and nicer to each other. And because there, there was this real belief that women have certain traits of kindness and niceness, and men are the ones with the violent tendencies. What the power does is completely turns this on its head. Uh, the power itself is, is what creates the traits, not, not the biology of the person. So in the power, um, the women um, realise that they have um, they can control men and as a result you get all sorts of different things going on so you get some women trying to get power legitimately through government but in some countries in the world women take power through violence through um, diminishing men through sexually abusing men through raping men and through killing men 
all the things that we see now happening to women in the power, it's reversed and it's happening to men. And I think it's a really important point that the novel is making is that it's the, often the weaker group in society that are deemed as the more kind and the more um, helpful and the more able to um, share and look after others. Um, because the strong don't have to have those traits. They don't have to appease another group more powerful than them. So they don't have to develop those particular traits. And those traits of kindness and being caring actually come about through the way we bring up the perceived weaker group in society. So there's lots of times that Neil in his letter to Naomi apologises and said, oh, but I'm just a men's writer. Um, he's making a comment of the fact that we have a label for women's writing, we call it women's writing, but we don't apply the same label to men. There is no such thing as men's writing. So writing is, is not labelled or categorised when it comes from men in the same way as it is when it comes from women. And I think the reason the power is the handmaid's tale of the day is because we have moved on from thinking that a world run by women would be a wonderful, peaceful, utopian place. And what we're realising is that the traits the, the traits that we think are biological are not. They are socially constructed by the way we are brought up and the messages transmitted to us um, from society. So I highly recommend The Power um, as a novel that really makes you think and will make you hopefully challenge these perceived gender differences. I'm just about to go on actually and read a book, um, I can't remember the author now, called um, playing with the boys which actually examines in a bit more detail why we still segregate men and women in sport so I'm going to do a review on that um, when I've read it um, that would fit quite well with this video but I really would be interested in your um, comments below if you've read The Power or if you have any um, examples of how um, perceived gender differences have affected your life and the expectations of what you could or couldn't achieve be you male or female because I think um, gender stereotypes are damaging to both men and women. I don't think it's useful for men to believe that they shouldn't cry and that they shouldn't show weakness. And that's probably why, sadly, um, suicide rates are much higher in men than they are in women. And it's not useful for women to think that they can't um, succeed in technology or become um, business leaders or world leaders. So I think gender stereotypes are very constraining for both of us. And of course, there's all these people that don't fit neatly into one gender or another. So you have people who um, identify themselves as intersex, who may have both um, sexual characteristics in their bodies. Um, or you just have, might have people who just don't identify with the gender at all. They don't see gender as important in terms of ex describing themselves. Um, so yeah, please do put some comments below about what you think about this video so that we can open up a discussion. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you again soon. Bye bye.